What's up, everybody? Welcome to Hot Fortunity Investors, where real estate investing meets beer. <laughs> Guys, it is already almost the end of June. We're almost at Independence Day, and uh, it's a crazy world out there. We're going to get into that a little bit. Um, of course, we're going to focus more on the real estate of real estate side of the crazy real estate side of the craziness. But uh, yeah, we got an awesome night. We got Mrs. Carrie Copenhaver in here tonight, and uh, Sean's going to introduce her in a little bit. But just awesome person to have here, involved in so much in real estate. Uh, as we said in the advertisement, she's like a Swiss Army knife in the game of real estate <laughs> here in Hampton Roads. And so we're just excited to have her. Her knowledge and information, um, especially on Airbnb, but also just on mm -hmm. the real estate market in general. Um, we have uh, we're actually going to break Airbnb up into two sections. We're going to do Carrie tonight, and then we've got Matt Fisher from Tesseract uh, Property Management. They manage um, short-term rentals in Norfolk and Virginia Beach, and he's going to be a wealth of knowledge for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Carrie knows him as well, and uh, I've been telling Sean about him, and uh, I think it's going to be really cool. So I think we've got two very different business models between what Carrie is doing and what Matt's doing. So we're going to break it up into two months. It's something that people have been very interested in. So we're going to hit Airbnb short term rentals two months in a row, and we hope you guys join us. If you got questions, please bring them on. Um, put them on the Facebook page, and we will do our best to respond to that. Uh, so my name is Alex Winfield and I am your friendly local neighborhood real estate agent slash investor friendly guy. Um, and this is opportunity investors, uh, Mr. Sean Bowen up there in one of your corners or above me. Um, he is, uh, the co-host co whatever we're called in this thing and, uh, um, mingler co something. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I do I do the real estate sales and the property management, and he is a wholesale guy. The thing that brings us together is we love to talk about real estate, and uh, that's why we're here. Normally, we would do this at a brewery, um, yes. but so yes. today we're bringing the beer home to us, and we are bringing the information home to you. Um, and guys, I didn't have that written down or anything. That was just on the spot. Right mm. oh. so, <laughs> the cuff. The cuff. so yeah, there's a lot going on out there in the real estate market. Um, I think Carrie's going to jump on it a little yep. bit, but um, it's hot out there. It's it's crazy. So, you know, we'd love to hear what Carrie has to say about that. But um, yeah, if if you're if you're not in the mix, I can tell you right now there is very low inventory. And no matter what, I think there's always opportunity. So with these things, we really try to jump in to say, what is the opportunity out there that's best for you right now? Um, and, you know, once again, hop on the Facebook page, throw out some questions, throw out some ideas, start some conversations up. This is, this is all about, you know, getting information. When Sean and I, you know, got together on this, it was because we like talking about this stuff and we wanted to create opportunity for ourselves informationally and and for other people networking so hard to network right now i get it um but eventually we are going to bring this back out into the world uh we don't know how soon it might be august i don't know we've kind of wait next month july sorry we always do it at the end of the month so it's confusing might do july we haven't really gotten that far yet but i think i think before the end of the summer we'll we'll get back to you know uh, actual location but until now it's actually been kind of cool and uh we've we've had a lot of people joining us that you know from all over the place that weren't able to join us before so it's been nice um but yeah i'm gonna get out of the way and quit stepping on my own feet and uh i'm gonna let sean introduce carrie to you guys don't forget your toast man always gotta have your toast all right may your castle be secure and your cup overflowing whoop 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 all right, let's get it going. What's up, guys? Sean Bowen, Full Circle Investment Group, and wholesalingoutofthebox.com. 
I want to thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, again, Alex mentioned it. You have a lot of people on the screen here I want to talk about. We got Ashley Little that works with Full Circle Investment Group. We got Vanessa that works with Alex and Cameron Peters um, that works with uh, Full Circle Investment Group. And of course, Carrie that is joining us tonight and speaking. So thank you so much for joining us and hanging out. Uh, guys, we're here for the next hour. Uh, please, over on the side of the screen, join us on the activity and the logs and write questions. And um, we're not really going to bring anybody on live at the moment, but we're trying to answer your questions as they come up and try to be interactive with you guys over there. But uh, definitely, like Alex said, I'm local in the market. Um, Alex and I met quite a few years ago. We've had, fortunately, opportunity up and running and doing great. And uh, the girls that you see here help us make that happen. The ladies are awesome, making us look good in the front while they take care of a lot of stuff in the back, make us look like we know what we're doing. So it's really cool. I want to thank them yes. out here in the front and always thank you so much for helping us. Um, so Cameron, Cameron is over there as acquisitions for Full Circle Investment Group, and um, he helps a lot as well. And he is also a new chapter that we have over on the Peninsula side. So if you're interested and you're watching from afar and maybe you're on the peninsula side of Hampton Roads for the Yorktown, uh, Newport News, Hampton, Jamestown area, um, he's going to be starting up again shortly to have meetings over there, at the breweries and just taking what we've already done here on the south side and just starting to extend it out. So that's what he's here and what he does and huge, huge help there. Um, Cameron's been in the business for a little while now, done multiple deals um, and starting to build his portfolio. So Looking forward to watching you grow, Cam. Appreciate you being here. Um, all right, Miss Carrie, let's do it. Carrie. <laughs> Guys, uh, Carrie Copenhaver, I've been around since probably the past six years, I know for sure. Done deals with her, um, done mm -hmm. business with her on multiple different levels. Um, also, uh, a pre not wouldn't say she's a member of Trig and works the board, right? So she's been there <laughs> for quite some time. Um, works yeah. the board. Yeah, works the board. Like he's part of the board. Um, so been part of that group for a long time. Huge wealth of information. Um, huge help. A lot of you know questions that I couldn't answer back in the day. She helped me get through, and then vice versa. Things that her and I bounce questions off each other all the time. Mm -hmm. So huge, huge help there, um, and just a wealth of information. So tonight she's coming to us and helping us talk about her experience and what her knowledge is on the Airbnb world. And the good, the bad, the ugly, what COVID-19 did to it and what it's doing to it. Mm -hmm. So really looking forward to it. So without any more questions, talk to us, Carrie, and let us know what we got going on. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to come and speak to your people and opportunity. I always uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know that I love teaching anyway, and I love talking and I love beer. So it's a really solid fit. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Yeah. And I, I'm going to, I'll give you a little bit of my background and then we'll talk a little bit about the business that I do. And then we'll kind of get into um, current market conditions. We're going to get into a little bit more than just Airbnb. I want to share with you a lot of what's happening in um, the real estate world uh, in our arena with COVID and the impact that it's had on our market. So I, um, quick, uh, a quick background. I was a forensic chemist at the state crime lab, uh, for a number of years. And then I had my kids and I, you know, had an epiphany that I was really trading my life for mediocrity, because if you've ever worked for the government, you know, that you can't do too little, but you can't do too much either. So I just need you in this middle band of mediocrity, just do enough to get by. And, you know, I just, the thought of trading my life for mediocre just was not exciting. And I had these babies. I was tired of dropping them off at seven in the morning and picking them up at 5 p.m. at night and letting somebody else raise them. So I figured there had to be another way to generate income. Um, at the same time, um, I don't know if you guys know Carlton Sheets. It's like I'm probably telling my age a little Old bit. Old school. Old school. So <laughs> Carlton Sheets is like the guru of like, here's the first information seller for real. CD style, so, man. CD style. Right? So long story short, I mean, you know, we bought that course, but uh, I didn't do anything with that. Around 2005, um, I went to a seminar ended up buying a package there and got into real estate investing. It, it took me a year before I felt comfortable enough to pull the trigger. And that would have put us, you know, right in the midst of a, a parent recession that we were having. 
And I'm going to, as we go through this conversation, um, I'm a huge mindset. The foundation of my business is my mindset. That is the foundation. And you're going to hear me say things. And I, I hope that they are impactful for you because everyone has ginormous potential, but this is your limiting factor. What's happening right in here is your limiting factor. So I started in real estate, went ahead and get my license. My husband's like, go get your license. I'm like, I don't want to get my license. I want to be an investor. And uh, we had that conversation a couple of times. I went ahead and got my license um, in 2006. I was rookie of the year in my firm because I wasn't participating in the recession. I heard about it, but I chose not to participate in it. So we did our first flip that year. We were still flipping. Um, so long story short, we did the first one, second one, the third one. Took us like a year and a half to get those. But I had, uh, you know, I invested $15,000 in the first property that we did. I took it sub two. I didn't know that's what I was doing at the time, but that's what I did. And turned that 15, a year and a half, I walked out of a closing with a $110,000 check in my hand. So Ooh. that was just a uh, continuous, like roll it, roll it, roll it. And as the opportunities got bigger, the che checks got larger. So, um, of course, at that juncture, there was no turning back because <laughs> I'd never seen a check like that before. That was more than I ever made in a year, two <laughs> years three years <laughs> awesome. salary all in one wow. check. But anyway, um, so we've been investing and I've been an agent since 2006. Uh, I absolutely love it. We are rehabbers and flippers and we've been doing that um, for a long time. We got, we finally got into buy and holds like five years ago. Um, and then like three years ago, I want to say, yeah, it was three years ago because I've had 941 for three years. I was at, um, I think this, this is my fourth year doing my fourth season as an, as a host. So one of the guys at Trig just, you know, he started talking about this Airbnb and I, I was like, what are you talking about right now? And he had this place in Norfolk. It was a condo. We'll talk about condos in a minute. You cannot do Airbnb and condos unless the condo docs allow it. So that's a little side note that you need to like scribble down on paper. Don't buy something until you've had it confirmed that you can actually perform a short term rental there. So anyway, um, Eric Giles, he was talking about this condo he had in Norfolk and he's cash flowing it. And he's like, look at this, you know, and he was making like he was cash flowing it by probably five hundred dollars a month or so, which was pretty. I mean, that's big, big money for a, for a property manager or for a landlord. So um, I just happened to be on Nextdoor app. This guy, and he, you know, BA's hilarious. BA is like 74 years old. <laughs> BA posted on Nextdoor. I have four properties that I want to sell with owner financing. Call me. And I was like, bring, hello. And it took me two months to land him. But I finally got him. He had three condos and a townhouse and I wanted the townhouse because it's simple fee ownership and I have anything to worry about. So I locked that deal up and he had tenants in there and he's like, well, what are you going to do with this place? And I said, well, I'm going to turn it into a short term rental. And I told Mike, I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And, and I'm one of those ready fire aim people. I'm just going to go do it and I'll figure it out along the way, knowing that you know, I have a great partner with me and we'll figure it out. It can't, it's not rocket science, right? It's not like um, brain surgery. So you'll figure things out as you go along. So we, um, we went ahead and purchased that property 10% down and 5%, I think it's four, 5% for 20 years. And, you know, and he's an older gentleman. So I got a first right of refusal on any note reduction that I presume that his daughter's going to try to sell the note at some point in time to cash it out. So I'm like, yeah. I get first right of refusal nice. <laughs> if anybody ever comes to sell that note. But BA's been awesome. He, 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 when I showed him the numbers, he was blown away because he was making like, he was renting it for $900 a month. He was way behind the time. If he had, you know, he could have gone up to probably $1,200 a month. But we turned around in the first year and made like thirty thousand dollars on that particular unit. Obviously, I was hooked at that point because I told Mike, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. We went ahead and furnished the place, and then I took the pictures with my cell phone, put it up on Airbnb, and like within forty eight hours, the entire summer was booked. Like all weekend, it was like ping, 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 all these notifications, and so. So that's really kind of, that's just how we started was just blind luck. 
Well, at the time, there weren't that many places on that street that were being sold. And but all the neighbors were paying attention to what we were doing. They all knew what we were doing. And the next thing you know, they're coming up to me like, hey, do you want to buy my house? Or, hey, that house is getting ready to go on the market. So we ended up with four on that street. And then um, I picked up another house through a, a, a sub two. It's a, I'll tell that story later if we want to get into it. But anyway, I have five. I have five that I own personally. And then I manage one for a friend of mine that's right around the corner. Cause he was doing annual rentals on his. And I was like, dude, you've got to let me turn that thing into a short term rental so I can make you some real money because it, they, they generate, well, I'll put it to you this way. Last year we grossed on those, well, technically on those six, right. But nine thirty eight was still pretty new. So that this only counts. They I only did like $7,000 on nine thirty eight last year. So that would mean that I grossed 193,000 last year on five, on five units. Woo! And Lakewood, yeah, Lakewood had only been on the market for six months. So that Lakewood by itself, which is a four bedroom, three and a half bath, awesome. 2,600 square Man. foot home that I picked up as a sub two that was in foreclosure. We reinstated that loan, um, that 3% loan, $2,500 note payment on that thing. And we did like $60,000 on that last year. Damn, that's awesome. I know. So, that's crazy. so we did, yeah. I mean, if you look at my Airbnb stats, we did over two hundred thousand dollars last year. Well, nice. It's gross, it's not net, but I but I assure you the net is it's a little less than half. So yeah, it, still it is, not bad, right? <laughs> it is yeah, that's that's awesome. That yeah, operational nice. expenses are roughly forty percent. So uh, roughly forty percent profit, forty percent operational expenses. On five on five properties. On five properties. Damn. Damn. Very good. Yeah. So that's a that's a it's that's incredible. A, that's a salary so right this, there. This year we um and, and mind you, I still have mortgages. I paid off a second note on one of them last year, but you know, if we didn't have mortgages on that, you're right. That's that's all it's so we're power paying all the notes down on those things so that we can nice. and and they keep appreciating because they're close to the ocean front. Um so and it's it's been incredible. Are all five of them at the ocean front? All five of mine are. I have a duplex in Norfolk that I'm getting ready to put one on Airbnb. It's right by, it's in Ghent. So it's super close to the hospital and it's close to ODU. So I'm really right. excited about that one. It's just a little two bedroom, two bath. We're almost done renovating that. We bougied it up. It's got, it's killer. <laughs> Mike's done an amazing job on it. So I'm excited to get that one up and running and see how that one does. And I am going to, I'm going to, I'm actually, so we self-manage. I'm not going to self-manage that one because it's too you know, it's too far and having yeah. to make that trip and blah, blah, blah. And Matt's already out there. So I'm going to give that one to Matt and let nice. him run it because, you know, I'm just getting at an age where um, work is fun, but life is life and life is not work. <laughs> so true. True. <laughs> so true. You you're, have always, you're always to... doing something different. That's, that's yeah. amazing. That... <laughs> I, th I think that's smart. I mean, and Matt's got it figured out out there too. So yeah, he does. He's, he's got a tight, tight market. So, so let's talk about, um, COVID, right? So last year we obviously we had a kick ass banner year with Airbnb. And so I took that same seller financed unit that I'm telling you about was not really updated. The kitchen cabinets had started falling apart and I'm trying to get, you know, I, I started out at one thirty-five a night, like this would be my fourth season this year. I'm pushing the envelope. I'm like, let's go for two fifty. Let's get two fifty in the middle of the summer. So I was planning on like blowing it out this year. And so we, we, I, and of course, you know, any tax person will tell you, you know, start, I had a nice little reserve fund. So I used that money to go and renovate that property. We did a, put a new kitchen in, blah, blah, blah. Right after I did that, <laughs> right after depleted that reserve fund, then COVID hit. Boom. And I was like, huh. Hmm. Well, this is a pickle. What are we going to do? Um, you know, I, I'm going to tell you a couple things. Real estate is a relationship business. Okay. That is a key rule that you need to understand if you're going to be successful in this business. It's a relationship business. True. And I, you, you build your reputation, right? People know you from your reputations. One of the things my dad taught me was character and integrity. 
And, yes. you know, I yes. loved being able to go anywhere in the city and people loved my dad. Like he was a custom home builder and he built a reputation for himself. And I was able to leverage his, his reputation to get us started in real estate investing using his resources because my dad was fair, paid quickly, demanded a certain quality, you know, things of that nature. He had a good reputation at the bank. He always paid his bills. So when he brought me in there, they were like, oh, if you're Billy's daughter, we're, you're good to go. Nice. So um, that helped us out a, a lot. Um, <clears throat> where was I going with that conversation? <laughs> time for some more Relationship beer. Relationship business. <laughs> and so I leveraged that when this COVID hit, I thought, okay, what am I going to do right now? And I realized that um, there was a high demand for people who had just sold their house, needed a place, but now they, they all PCS, you know, everybody's changed a station and the military got shut down. So they, you know, you have people that were in flux because they had just sold a house and had nowhere to go. You had, um, I had people that were escaping, like I had some people that came here from Washington. So I'm, I'm coming full circle with this conversation, but what we, what I realized was I had, I don't necessarily need to make $3,000 a month. I just need to get all my expenses covered. And if I can cash flow, that's a bonus. There's a huge uh, group of individuals that fit that need where they needed month long rentals for a variety of reasons, especially during COVID. I mean, I literally had some people, I guess she worked for the Navy out of Washington and she's out of Washington. So I had one of the units with that person in there for three months. I had them, because I, you know, my cancellations just went through the roof. You know, April hit, everybody canceled in May, everybody canceled in April. I had um, probably half of March that canceled and we were scrambling. I told Mike I should be a professional chess player after this because I was moving the pieces <laughs> all around the board. Like, I'm like, okay, 953, I've got somebody I can get in there for three months. Now I need to take the people that were set up here and move them to another location. You know, I could cancel. I, we had the um, Airbnb was has an extenuating circumstances policy. And in the midst of a pandemic, they were very guest um, leveraged in that situation where they were. And it was it was fascinating because I belong to a lot of host groups to see people arguing about whether or not they were going to give people a full refund. It's like this is unprecedented times yeah and you can't who the f is gonna like plan for a pandemic like, yeah just give people their damn money back you can't yeah. even get on an airplane right now you know so we <laughs> did 100 percent refunds on all cancellations even now if somebody wants to cancel now i just that's fine because i'm not i'm not worried about that i'm not going to hold someone hostage under these circumstances and keep their money. That's just bad karma. Oh yeah. Right. And another principle, because I do keep reserve funds. Now I had depleted a lot of reserve funds doing that renovation, but I had faith in my capabilities to keep things rolling to at least break even. But I have plenty of other reserves because the money that I get from my landlording activities, I I don't live on that money. Right. That's passive income for a later date. My active income is through real estate flipping and through being an agent. So a very active agent business as well. But we were, we were, we had to shift very quickly. And because of my reputation, because of the relationships that I have, I was able to connect with many different agents that had a demand uh, because their clients fit into this weird space where they had just sold a house or getting ready to buy a house or whatever and needed some, needed a place to, you know, lay their head for two months while we, while the whole country figured out what we were doing. So I had out of the six, I had four of them month to month rentals, premium rates because all the utilities are included. So I'm getting 16 to $1,700 a month, still cash flowing, probably $400 a month, which is, you know, I, I was, telling you guys before we got started, you know, my, my gross profits down by like 50%, but I'm still cash flowing significantly. I'm not in a loss at all. Um, 
527, my big house is actually up, but we just started that one in May of last year. So it's hard, you know, it's those numbers aren't, I don't have a good track record of years to be able to give you solid information. That one in particular, because my carrying costs on that house is $3,000 a month, right? Between utilities and my um, mortgage payment. I talked to, I have a partner on that. Karen Tyler is my partner on that one. I'm like, man, I don't know what the scope of this is going to look like long term. Why don't we just put a tenant in there? And oh, is that that big one? That. Big square footage That's one? Big house. Nice. So, how close is that one so, to the beach, Karen? How close? Mm -hmm. It's a half a mile. It's on Lakewood Circle, right right between like 13th Street, 12th Street, right, right down there, right by the school. Gotcha, gotcha. So, I was like, you know, why don't we, I, and I really vacillated on turning all of them into long-term rentals. But at the same time, I thought, you know, I, we can, we can manage this. We're going to be just fine. Everything's going to open up pretty quickly and I can handle the townhouses are like a thousand bucks each, you know, or 12 or $1,500 each, but that house is three grand a month. And if I don't make the money in the summertime, I'm going to be out of pocket in the wintertime. So I ended up finding this amazing tenant who's coming in September. So I'm able to cash flow the entire summer and then put her in. I gave her an 18 month lease so we can get through next summer to see how things are going to play out. And then, so she'll, she can either, it's up to her. Well, I don't know. It's up to me. Like at that juncture, I'm going to be able to take a thing, you know, put, take a pulse of what's happening in the market at that point in time. And then I'll either make that a short-term rental again, or I'll just keep her in there for a while, for a while. But keep in mind, she's my mortgage is twenty five hundred. She's paying me thirty two hundred dollars a month. So I'm cash flowing seven hundred dollars a month on that property. So yeah, yeah not that bad. So bad worst like, case scenario there. It's a win win. It's a win win for yeah. me. So and she wants to, she wants to actually. There's a downstairs bedroom. And it has a full bath. It has its own, like you can get to it in its own entrance. We can close the door and lock it so they can't get into the main living area. And the last owners actually put a kitchen in the garage, a kitchen, a kitchen in the garage. In the garage. You don't have one in, in your garage. garage? A whole kitchen. Come on. What the it's hell? a two car garage. So, right? It's, it's like a whole new meeting that so, she said, he said, he should. Yeah. Right? So, but what's cool about that is she wants to do Airbnb and, you know, just as a means to make extra money. And she's like, hey, you manage it and we'll split it. I'm like, oh, that sounds lovely. So, in addition to that $700 a month, I'll, you know, I'll rent out that room downstairs and we'll make whatever, maybe another five or ten thousand dollars a year on that so. hey carrie real quick we had a question over here um it doesn't say who it was because it just doesn't show me the name but it says uh what was it like to set up the systems and processes to run the airbnbs any notable failures along the way when you first converted from the annual rentals to airbnbs yeah so okay systems and processes that's hilarious <laughs> I did not write that. I did not. <laughs> write that. I would not do that to Carrie. I promise. Okay. <laughs> just to be, just to be okay. fair, this is this is Tyler Ben Sand. He's a he's a systems and processes guy too. Hey Tyler, Tyler, I know he is. Yeah, Carrie. Now, I, you know that is yeah. such a question for Matt Fisher with Tesseract. Like when you see, I'm just doing this on a on a little scale. So the systems and, and pro, I mean, we, we have our handyman, we've got all that stuff set up. Um, so that's not a big deal, but everything like the way this, you need to find, you just need to have a good team. Once you have a good team, the rest of it is super easy, right? It's just checking in, like you automate, use technology to automate as much of the process as you can. I have digital locks. Um, I, I give a new code every time I have templates set up on Airbnb. It's so the difference between annual and short-term rentals, as far as management, I have to touch the short-term rentals every day. I have to touch them every day and you have to deal with whatever situation arises and be able to navigate that pretty effectively. So would, would you say it's more of a side business than a passive income? It is an active income. Now, unless you, unless of course you 
go ahead and let somebody do the management on it. So if you outsource your project management on it, you're good to go. And and that's what I'm saying. Matt Fisher's got they they are the they have they have got it down. They have like eleven people. They have eleven full time employees, probably more by now. But they have they do have a system because their volume and is so much more significant than mine. Mine are like four little house, you know, five houses right down the street from me. So it's not. I don't need a huge system to run what we have going on, but it's, and it's not, there's really not much to it. I know it sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. So once you kind of, and you, you know, set everything up on auto ship on Amazon, right? So it gets delivered right to the place. And then my cleaning lady puts it in the shed for me. So I don't have to go to the store to buy supplies. And all that stuff is there. Um, again, I do everything digital. So the locks and everything is digital. My cleaner has the schedule. She she logs into my account to find out when she needs to be there. So we just kind of confirm with each other. The biggest thing is you have to have somebody who's constantly communicating because you'll get in, uh, requests and inquiries pretty continuous. Like that's a, but it doesn't take me any more than like half an hour a day to run the whole Airbnb business. Nice. So, and unless we have to go do something specific to the property, like we had a little dolphin mailbox over at 527, that last rainstorm, like it took it out. <laughs> so we had to go replace it, but just little stuff like that. You know, I mean, you, you have constant maintenance on these things uh, just because they get beat up a little bit more. I would, you would think that they don't, but they, they get beat up a little bit more than a, than an annual rental. Well, yeah, I think, I think it's awesome. Um, having, you and Matt um, are, it's just, it's so cool because we've got people that want to do Airbnb, but they, they really don't want a side hustle, you know? And then we've got yeah. people that really want that side hustle and want to make that income and they're going to go out there and do that hustle. But it's good to be able to have you on here and to say, you do have to hustle. Like, this is not like, you know, this isn't free money that people are just handing out. It's money you got to work for, but you can, yeah. You can crush it too. So I think it's, I think it's awesome it. to have your perspective to say, yeah, let's go over here and hustle and let's, and let's do this. And um, I mean, that seems to be your, your, uh, your model anyways. <laughs> My modus operandi. I'll go figure um, it out as we go along. Yeah. <laughs> One of your comments was, uh, or one of your statements was ready point aim. No, ready fire aim. Nice. <laughs> Nice. Ready, fire, ready, aim. Fire. Awesome. ready, fire. It's supposed to be ready, aim, fire, but I don't do the aiming part. Oh, I do the fire, and then I figure it out when I get there. Like, oh, yeah, I should probably should have done this differently. So, you know, that's, that's the benefit of these groups, right? Is that this is, you know, the, the ability to, get, to connect with people and listen to their experiences so you can build a better mousetrap, right? That's the whole idea. This is again, like real estate investing is not rocket science. And there's a bazillion people who have been successful at it. Just freaking follow in the footsteps. Stop trying to blaze your own trail. Or reinvent the wheel. Blaze your own trail. You don't have to reinvent the wheel either. And don't give me that shit like, well, I'm not going to do it like that. It doesn't work. Okay, but yeah, it's been Well, you're stupid then. <laughs> I know. I, I'm so dumb. I don't know why you do it like that. I'm like, okay, well, that guy makes a million dollars a year. I'm going to go figure out another way to do it. <laughs> I'm going to go figure out another way to do it. Yeah. All right, we got another question over here. Justina Robinson asked, uh, what was your criteria for property acquisition? Okay, this one, because of its location, right? So I, all right, first of all, let me tell you another quick little story. I bought, I, okay, <laughs> this is another phenomenal deal. <laughs> it's crazy. So um, I had one of my agent friends call me and say, Carrie, I need you to help me with this house. I need to sell this property. And there was just, there was no meat on the bone. Right. And I said, look, the best thing I can do is take over the payments. That's, that's all I have to offer. I said, if you, if he wants me to do that, I'm down. The guy wasn't behind VA 3.25%, right? No, no arrearage. Ooh. Just, he just wants out. He owed 180 property needs a little bit of work. I'm getting ready to put a roof on it this weekend. Um, and I mean, I've had it for over a year right now. And it was, you know, it's a tiny, it's one of those tiny houses over at Lenny Haven. It's a four bedroom, two bath, like a thousand square feet. Literally, <laughs> literally. That plenty of room to expand. Tight, tight bedroom. Right? There's yeah. pl plenty of room to, to add on to it. So 
So anyhow, I got this property and then another another agent like literally so for $2,800 in closing costs, I've acquired this property. I have nothing in it. The only thing we did was clean it out. That's it. Another agent come to me looking for a seller financing property. I'm like, well, let's talk. So I ended up leasing it to him. He did Airbnb on that property, did like $30,000 on that property. I'm like, hmm. Now I'm still still not doing Airbnb on that one. I, I still turned it into an annual rental when he gave it back to me because the city city regulations changed and he would have to invest in a new driveway and blah, blah, blah for it to make sense to him. And he didn't want to do that. And he didn't want to buy it for the price that I wanted to sell it for. <laughs> I wasn't highly motivated to sell it because it was a free house. <laughs> so, and it was so, making money. Uh, and it's making money. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm not really motivated. I'm not your motivated seller right now. So long story short, criteria like anywhere in Virginia Beach is going to work. No condos, no HOAs, no POAs, simple fee ownership. And now the city has gotten a little quirky now because they have all these regulations and they're very easy to find. Just type, you know, Google in Virginia Beach short term rental regulations. So I don't have to go into the whole spiel. But I will tell you one major factor that is going to limit your ability to get a short term rental approved by zoning is parking. You have to have a nine by 18 space for every bedroom in the property. So if you don't have a nine by 18 space now. And that's you better know, than Norfolk, anybody, right? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. So Norfolk is kind of similar, but you have to jump through a lot more hoops. You cannot do Airbnb in Chesapeake unless you're zoned for bed and breakfast. And I don't know, I think Portsmouth has a bunch that are operating under the radar and Portsmouth is just Portsmouth. And I don't, I don't know if they know what they're doing. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows what's happening in Portsmouth right now. So. I think they said they don't think they would argue with that. anything about it. <laughs> What'd you say, Alex? I think they've said that they, that they're illegal, but that it's not enforced is what, what I've seen. It was illegal in Norfolk until I think two years ago, but they just, right. you know, it, it was it was so so let's talk about illegal the virginia beach is interesting it was illegal because, on Ocean View. Let me yeah no let's talk about what illegal means um because i think you know of course i'm one of those like it's my property i should be allowed to do what i want to do with it but zoning is set up already like if you look in the zoning ordinances they're already written in no no rentals less than 30 days so that's what quote unquote makes them illegal and quote unquote why they're not don't meet zoning standards why you have to do a conditional use permit virginia beach is interesting because we now have a residential tourist zone in the in it so they rezoned part of virginia beach down by the ocean front and it's like uh like 23rd street to 19th street and then it tees down pacific and anything in that zone is a by right Right. So you don't ha all you have to do is go what down to the city. And so 23rd to 19th on Atlantic. Well, like if you go, if you go, well, OK, so that would be heading west or heading east. So if you come, if you're heading east and then north and south, if you it's like a T and Where that entire. So like rainy or something or I think it's well, I think it's pretty much Pacific Avenue, maybe Baltic, but. It's Pacific Avenue or Baltic Avenue, and it goes straight down there. And those zones are considered, if you look up zoning, you'll see an RT, you know, RT designation, and that's a residential tourism district. And you can do Airbnb there by right. You don't have to go get a conditional use permit. All you have to do is go down and pay taxes on it. If so you're doing west, home right? sharing, what's that? You're further west than that location, right? I Yeah, I am not in that zone. So, so you had to get conditional use? Well, so most of mine are grandfathered in because we we had them before. So all we had to do, you know, all I have to do is is go down and say we had them and show proof that I had them by those dates and they're grandfathered in. So we're good to go. on. Now, have you heard because um, I've been doing most of my stuff in Ocean View in Norfolk. Um, I haven't been doing quite as much in Virginia Beach uh, with with my clients uh, in Virginia Beach. Do you feel like they're allowing conditional uses to to come out into play or are they kind of pushing those away right now oh my gosh so i don't know what city council is doing and it's a little like the, i think they're trying to develop uh 
a standard protocol, but they've also created these. I'm going to give you a great example. This is, this is, you guys know Jason Swango. Yep. All right. So Jason, for those of you that are listening, you don't know Jason. Jason is an attorney. He is the, uh, firm for men. So he pretty much like his firm is specific to divorce and custody for, for men. Um, he bought a property in shadow lawn for probably high threes. I'm sure he put another 60 or 70 into it. And then knowing the regulations, he had the driveway poured. So there were four spots four nine by 18 to meet regulations. He goes to, to get his conditional use permit. They say, well, wait a minute. We didn't think you were going to concrete and pave your whole front yard. Now you're setting a precedence. And oh. they declined it. They denied They denied his application. Oh, wow. Interesting. So just because you meet the regulations, that does not mean you're going to get approved. Now, he has he appealed it, and he has another hearing very curious to see how that's going to play out. Very curious. I tell you what, so it I, was a learning curve to see how those things play out. It was, it was yeah. just pretty interesting. I will, I will tell you that if you don't show up for your hearing, you're going to get declined. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, but I'm serious. Yeah. Like they are, you have a couple of people on the city council that are automatic nose. Barbara Henley is one. Just saying, <laughs> and um, keep that in mind next time it's time to vote. Sometimes it's just time. It's just hard for older people to get into a motion where things change. Yep. It's just it. I mean, you have so many cities who have done so many different things, like limited the number of permits that they put out there. I mean, come up with some good plans that are working in other cities. Um, and I'm not opposed to the regulations that they have. I think the parking is a little challenging. And I think that they did that specifically to limit yeah. you know who could yeah. get a conditional use permit because parking is such a premium down here and it it is an issue i mean it parking is a problem but you know i have a three bedroom place i rarely ever have three cars show up there it's one or two you know and that that lakewood house i'm so lucky because when they constructed that the whole east side of the building is parking anyway so it meets all the parking regulations so i don't have any problems with it so I, I do have a neighbor over there complaining now because he just moved in and he's been a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> so you got another question over here for you. Uh, Justina says, does flood insurance affect your decision on buying a property? Always. Always. Yes, 100%. So, you know, you guys have to look at, at the bottom line, it's cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. And you, and you need to have multiple exit strategies. So if you're not going to live there or you're not going to rent it, can you flip it? What are you going to do? And I heard a quote uh, not too long ago from Mike Vernon, who in our industry is kind of the go-to flood insurance guy. And he talks about how to mitigate flood insurance and blah, blah, blah. He said that um, they're going to FEMA uh, basically to fight over the guidelines or over the maps because for every thousand dollars of flood insurance, it has a market impact of a negative ten thousand dollars on the purchase price. Does that make sense? So, if you have a two hundred thousand dollar house with a thousand dollar flood insurance, it's not going to sell for more than one hundred ninety thousand because the the you know it takes away buying power from your clients. Yep, that's interesting. It's, yeah, right. So that's cool to put a so, formula to that. Actually, yeah, keep that in mind. Um, the very first thing you should do anytime you're buying any property in Norfolk specifically is look up the flood zone. And I won't even flip AE flood zones unless I call ahead of time and find out what my flood insurance premium is going to be because, because of that rule of thumb, it's, I've kind of run, accidentally ran into that a couple of times and I was like, <laughs> I ran into Norfolk it too. Is, Not fun. Yeah. Yeah. You buy a property and you're trying to flip it and you're like, Oh, this is an AE flood zone. And, I mean, that happened like four years ago. It hasn't happened since because now, now I'm, you get more savvy to that. Uh, yeah, but 100%. And if you look at if you look at the projections, the flood projections, I mean, they're saying in 20 years, like the naval station is going to be underwater and a large part of Norfolk is going to be underwater. I don't know how true that is. It'll be interesting to see how that gets, <laughs> how the city, that's a meteorologist projection. Yeah. Right? So they're looking at rising 
rising waters and saying that a lot of Norfolk's going to be underwater in the next 20 years. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. We got somebody so, in here said <laughs> Carrie for local office. She's got a vote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm a little progressive. I don't know. And I don't like a lot of rules, so I probably wouldn't go over very well. Um let's talk about the market in general. So we've talked about so short-term rentals, right? So here's another principle I've taught my boys, and this is just so incredibly important for you to know is that when you get into real estate investing, you know, it cash flow, cash flow, cash is king. It, it, when you run into, I mean, who would have seen COVID coming, right? Who sees that coming? Um, you have to be able to react quickly, but you also need to have enough reserves. So low debt, high cash flow, you have options. You have options. You're not going to be in a place where, you know, I wasn't scared. It was more like a chess game for me. It was a strategic, I could have paid for them. I didn't want to pay for them. There's no fun and paying for them, the whole idea is to get somebody else to pay for them. So having that, playing that strategic game just excites me and it's fun for me. I'm not afraid of it. So get your house in order, people. Get your house in order, get your debts paid off, get your cash flow going. And that's where you, you really have freedom to make decisions in your life that are gonna enhance it and bring you, know, you more joy in it. Cause it's just, you know, Sean and I just had a um, colleague that passed away, uh, 42 years old, kick-ass boss lady investor. She worked her ass off, um, had, you know, found out she had throat cancer, was gone in a year. And it, it's that stuff just like it, it's a paradigm shift. It reminds you of what's really important in your life. And you know, working your entire life is not what it's about. It's about experiences and creating those experiences in your life, whatever that is for you, you know, whatever that is for you. I, I you know, love to surf. So when Nick said, let's go surf today, I was like, I can rearrange my schedule. Yep. <laughs> so that's what we did. <laughs> um, all right. So let's talk about COVID, COVID's impact. All right. So we were flipping houses when COVID came out. I had four properties that were in production when all this was going down. My main concern was it, I can't get supplies. So we immediately went out and like bought everything we could buy because I knew my guys would keep working because they were legitimately like, I mean, that's as socially distanced as you can get as being a contractor, right? They're just in the house doing their thing together. So we kind of get got everything, all the supplies we could get. Uh, luckily for us, construction was considered a uh, essential business. You have to stay in this house for the next 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. perfect. You can pick any one of these four houses. I don't care which one. This one needs that. This one needs stay that. So, yeah. So we got our, we kept our contractors super busy during that time frame. Um, I mean, my life as a real estate investor and agent did not change much during COVID. Uh, because I mean, we're still in the mix of it, but it has been all of our properties. We were able to get those finished. The biggest challenge was permitting process, um, and the appraisal process because people were just crazy and the inspectors don't want to be around anybody. The appraiser doesn't want to be around anybody. Uh, they stopped working in the offices and said, so you can't go down the city and pull anything. So it definitely slowed everything down pretty significantly. But because sellers have, you know, because nobody really knows, you know, everybody's in this state of limbo. They don't really know what's happening or how to plan. And is it going to be one month or two months or six months? I think everybody just kind of, they're like, I'm just going to stop right now and just wait. But then you have a whole nother sector of people. Like I still had buyer, I have tons of buyer clients and no inventory. Yep. So we're still selling houses and trying to sell houses if you can find them. And then, and then it's a, you know, multiple offer bid process. So you've got to come in yeah. super strong yeah. right now. With your flips, did so you, um, did you list any, like, what months did you list those, those flips you're talking about? The last, yo, oh, yeah. All of, all of them were listed and sold within one day, multiple offers. Only one of them that I saw. Um, I'm 
April. So I just closed Kennebec. So that one would have sold, you know, what, 30 days ago? What are we in June? So May, April and May. I'm just curious because I've been saying the same thing as you. And I feel like you talk to people outside of this area and they think you're crazy. But it's just, <laughs> I'm like, it's, it, it has gone. Like I told you, <laughs> so I got Roseland. So I was telling you guys this before we came on board, but I want to tell everybody else this because. I don't know if Will's listening. Tyler's listening. Tyler already knows this. So Tyler, when um, Roseland, Rose, when I bought Roseland for I think one twenty five, and then we did an addition on it. There was no comp over two thirty five, and then we were super slow on that one because we had to get permits and blah blah blah. We had other projects going on. So I mean, I've I've had that thing right at like seven months right now. Slow for us. But we did a pretty significant addition. It was an older house, 1940s, all hardwood floors, super cool house. Um, but there was no comp over 235. So lo and behold, then right after, uh, as we're finishing up, there's a property on the next street over that sold for 275. And I was like, well, I'm going to see if I can get 275 out of this. I mean, what? No harm in trying. I mean, I, I'm going to shoot for the moon. If I don't land there, I'll be somewhere in the stars. It'll be fun. It'll all work out. Yeah. So, so, so we put it at 275 and I'll be damned if we, because the market conditions are so hot. I didn't have any problems getting, no one questioned me on the purchase price. I sold it before it went on the market. Cause I had in my brokerage, same thing, like, right. So we're all communicating like who's got blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, I've got one over in Oceana, go check it out and sold it. It sold right at the first of June. Um, and so we were slow. I mean, I just had some problems on that one with subcontractors. The electrician was slow getting his final, blah, blah, blah. Finally got it all done. It closes tomorrow, but we close at 275. It appraised. Damn. That's awesome. That's I awesome. Know. That's huge. That is huge. That is a home you just run. just jumped your margin up to, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it's probably way more than you were planning on bringing home. That's way awesome. Way more. It's 40,000 more than I was thinking of bringing home. Uh, so, um, so the flipping market has been super hot. No issues there. Anything we put on the market gets picked up immediately. Uh, as an agent, uh, the biggest challenge I've run into as an agent is the lack of inventory and the fact that these are like 2000 and what, 2002, 2003, when people were just like mad hungry and like giving up home inspections and no closing costs. And that's the market that we're in right now. So if you've got a client that's you know, a new, I, like I have some new baby first home buyers and they need all their closing costs picked up and they're in that cherry spot, right? Like they're like, if we could just get it for 225, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> y'all are going to have to be patient because it's going to be hard. It's like we're going to be fighting with everybody to get that. So those relationships matter though, because I've had, I had another one we were bidding out, but you know, I, I was good friends with the listing agent and we knew we'd have a smooth transaction and so we were able to craft a better offer um, <clears throat> and then having that little extra, you know, relationship helps out a lot too. So uh, we've done, I've closed at the end of this month, I'll be, I'll, I'll break like 10 million in sales for this year, which last year only did 15 million total. So we're at the end of oh, June and I've already hit 10 million in sales. Exactly. Awesome. Man, that's Crazy. awesome. That's awesome. Very cool. So landlording, last topic and then you guys can ask any questions uh landlording has been interesting because they put a stay on uh, all evictions mm -hmm. and foreclosures um i'm very very lucky that we only, i only have six properties where i have annual tenants and then the other six are all short-term rentals none of my tenants missed a payment but lots of landlords were having chat like they can't now that money is still due uh, but you cannot you cannot evict anybody. Even right now, I don't think you can evict yet either. I think it's coming up towards the end of June that they'll start the eviction process. So um, I get it. A lot of people who are tenants, they've lost their jobs. Um, I know some people have gotten unemployment and then the stimulus check. Hopefully they've been applying that to their rent. But that has been a real challenge for a lot of landlords. <laughs> so I, I read a story. I was, and I don't know what the outcome is. So forgive me for not being able to finish this story. But this was one of those Facebook forums. It's a landlord forum, and this lady was talking. She had one apartment building, and all of the tenants came together and said, "We're not paying." 
oh, until this is over. Oh, man. Yeah, she's like, what am I going to do? Oh, my so, God. Did I mention relationships matter? If you take care of your people, <laughs> they will take care of you. To wow. me, it just tells me that she either had one horrible tenant or she was a bad landlord. Yeah. Or the property management was because there was no relationship there. Like I yeah. have relationships with my yeah. people. And I, you know, I will get out of all the self-management soon, probably in the next three years. What's how, yeah. what is kind of the price range of your um rental properties, your long term? Okay, Maverick doesn't equal any of those because that was a free house. <laughs> so but I prefer yeah. To buy like at a, you know right around a hundred thousand where I can rent them for a thousand twelve hundred dollars a month, like that's just such a sweet spot. And I like to find houses that need work so I can just rent them as they are. I'm not a slumlord, by the way, just for clarification. I want nice, neat, clean, livable houses, but they don't have to be updated because tenants are gonna like. I have a property in Cavalier Manor with the pink tile bathroom and the built-in wooden kitchen kitchen cabinets everything's original hardwood floors it's a cute house super cute house eight new hvac we just put a new roof on there so it's a very livable it's not cosmetically pretty but why why am i making it nice for tenants that are going to end up tearing it up they can yeah that stuff's lasted since the 40s yeah keep that stuff that's handled. Years. <laughs> yeah. it's with the, it's everybody much better else. made back then <laughs> how many hurricanes so, is that written out yeah, I'd like to start getting into multifamily. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little slower on the game than a lot of people because I've mm -hmm. I've spent, you know, I've specifically chosen to raise my kids. And now that they're older, I'm now I'm ready to go full force. So I just I'm getting my taxes back, uh, meet with my CPA tomorrow, and then I'm gonna go in for a credit line and it's game over right then. It's like I think I think you're about bye, to bye, see bye, a bye, bye. massive fallout in multifamily because they all have been on that game and they all drank the Kool Aid for the wrong number, yep. and I think yep. it's going to no, be a freedom. It's going to be like a huge fallout, and it would be like, <laughs> what do you mean people are buying for overpriced or what's? Yeah, hundred percent people are buying overpriced. Oh yeah, totally. Yes, they're not yes, paying totally. attention to the correct number. Like, and Carrie, you can speak to this because I think we've mm -hmm. talked about it a few times. You know, you've got a lot of guys out there for the past two, three years that have been talking about multifamily and how to do this, do that. You know, you got the Grant Cardone special over there where like two weeks into COVID, he goes bankrupt. You know what I mean? Like that's the kind of stuff where people were drinking the Kool-Aid and you bought the wrong number, you bought the wrong price and you got the wrong. Over leveraged. Ticket. So now Over when it comes down, the bank is like either you're getting those people just like in motivated seller leads and I think yeah. that's what's coming next. You know what I mean? Like they way overbought, you know, an HVAC goes out, a heater, water, water heater goes out, you know, something massive. They don't have the cash flow to take care of it. Out. Yeah. And that's cool. where like, cool, here we come. And like, I think you have all been looking at numbers that people are buying stuff at. And you're like, how do they buy at this? Because they're stupid. Yeah. They're doing. And then it's, I guess there's a point where it's like, um, well, know your numbers. That's why they bought it that and it didn't work. And yeah. You know. So know your numbers and play your game. Yes. You have to play your game. Do not get sucked into the emotion of I have to have this or, oh, my God, I'm missing out or I'll just build another little bit more. Don't. There will always be another deal. Yeah. And, you, and when you live in a space of abundance and know that there's always going to be another transaction, there'll be another deal. Don't worry about it. You have to play your game and let all the let everybody else play themselves out because they're, they're thin in the herd. <laughs> it's oh, Darwinism. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you guys think about, Carrie, what do you think about, um, and we've talked about this before on here. We've got a lot of residential side. You've got tenants not having to pay, but you also have people not having to pay mortgages. Do you think there's going to yep. be a foreclosure fallout here? And or at least a sub two. I see a great sub two opportunity market. And, and I, you know, people have different, Thoughts about sub twos. Uh, they work right circumstances. for you. <laughs> they, they, uh, because, because, but let's be clear about this. But because I'm a person of an integrity, I'm a. I know what. I know I will pay that bill before I pay my own bill because I gave my word that I would pay that bill. Yep. So I'm not going to let those go into foreclosure. I'll sell them before they go into foreclosure. I'll have somebody else take my position before I'll let it go into foreclosure. Yep. So that's awesome. that's you know I think that's 
that's a core characteristic that some people are missing. And that's what concerns me about the sub two is that oftentimes people will commit to that and then they can't fulfill the commitment because they did the wrong numbers or whatever the case may be, or there's, you know, they don't have reserves to be able to pay for that property. And then when they fall on hard times, they have title on the property. The person can't even do anything because now they're, they don't have title to it. They can't do anything. And now you've, you've, they're getting foreclosed on on a property they don't own. They can't do anything. So one of the things that we do as a stop gap, because I, it's important to me that if, if I'm not making that payment, that I'm not hindering the owner or the, or the person on the mortgage, we, we escrow a pocket deed that I have signed that if I'm, if I'm missing payments uh, for more than 60 days, they can contact the settlement attorney and get the, get ownership transferred right back that's over. Cool. I'll have to, I'll have to yep. give you a call about that. I like that. Cause yep. that's so it's, you know, it's, all the things about doing sub two is. Yep. What happens if you stop making the yeah. payments? I mean, I, you I get it back I, in 60 days with all the improvements and all yeah, the equity, good. you know, because if I can't hold up it, my end of the bargain side instead of just one sided, you know? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, right. Because it protects their interest just as much as it does mine. And if I can't fulfill my end of the bargain, I should be the one paying the penalty for that, not them. That's cool. So, yeah. And I mean, you know, I got hit by a bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, some, and nobody knows where, where, I mean, they should have the ability to get that back. Now I have my office set up with all my little books and where everything goes and all the blah, 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 blah. So that if that, if I know, because I was like, if that does happen, Mike would have no idea. He doesn't even know what we own. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Carrie. Uh, no, he does. He goes cuts the grass there all the time. Just kidding. Oh, my God. <laughs> all right, guys. We're right here at 9 o'clock, so want to kind of start to close it out. Um, anybody that's still here and watching, uh, if you got any questions, uh, bring them up here, and uh, the girls will bring them forward, and we'll try to get them to Carrie. Um, we're going to try to shut this thing down right at 9.15, if everybody's good with that. So, like, maybe 15 minutes of questions and answers. But if not, you know, we'll close out and finish up. I think there was a lot, a lot of good stuff. If you guys enjoyed this, please write some comments over here and let us know. Give us some hearts. Give us some likes. Um, yeah, this channel is something that we've been building for a little bit now, and it's trying to just build more recognition to people that are local to the market. That is one thing that we focus a lot on is local talent, people that are in the business doing it, not talking about it, you know, not talking about stuff from back in 2000. 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, this is active. Yeah. And Carrie is a really good example of somebody that was kept those relationships and did good business. And I think one of the ones I really hit on that I enjoy you said was um, invest in good times. That was something that we actually found a, a piece of art that was out in Miss Missouri, I think it was Mississippi, Missouri yeah. or somewhere out there. Yeah. And it's a cool little art drawing. It says invest in good times. And it's really a solid statement. Right. It's really solid. So a lot of good statements here. Ready, fire, aim. Um, work is fun. Life is fun. Life is not work. <laughs> yeah. That's Let me there, here's a couple of questions. Let me answer these real quick. So yeah, one on. is what is my Airbnb vacancy rates like in the off season? And how much of a hit does the cash flow am, am I willing to take in the winter? Great question. And so I'm all right, so in the summertime. I am pretty much at 99% vacancy. You always have those days in between. Um, in the winter time, I'm still hitting 70% occupancy. Wow. Awesome. Still a huge demand. Keep in mind that Virginia Beach, we have so many activities. You have, I'm also by the convention center that was done purposefully, which is going, we're opening up a new athletic center. So you have dance competitions, wrestling matches, blah, 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 blah stuff that happens all year round around here. Keep in mind that we are a heavy military installation. People come here to meet and see their family. There's way more demand than what you think there is. So keep that in hey, mind. I've got a, I've got something that I kind of wanted, like, so I've got people all the time. They want to look into buying like a vacation home in like Sandbridge or something. And I run the numbers and as an investor, I'm like, you know, you might, if you really want to be there, it probably, it probably makes sense. If that's where you want to be. Um, and that's kind of one of the things with vacation rentals, they're extremely seasonal. And then you kind of, I don't know, sometimes you do well, but 
when you start weighing all the costs in there. How do you think the Airbnb model um, kind of pair, like how does it go against like the- uh, yeah, the traditional the, vacation traditional rental model? Vacation model. Yeah. Okay, so here's the difference. Airbnb is what we call an industry disruptor, right? They came in and cut out the middleman and said, person to person, have you got a space? I just need a couch. I'm happy to take an air mattress. I'm coming to town. I need a cheap place to stay. You know, so it, it because of the versatility of Airbnb, those vacation rentals are just that. Like people just go there, rent it for a week, blah, blah, blah. But in the winter times, they pretty much sit empty. Airbnb is different. Like it is, it's come stay in my house. I'm going to San Diego or I'm going to a con conference or whatever. And they're and people just don't want to stay in hotels either. That's, we have definitely taken at least 10% of the business away from the local ho hotels, by the way. So that's the, that's the quote that I've been given multiple times. People want to place hotels have missed the mark because I mean, can, you can't even, you have four kids, you have five. How many do you have four now? Kids, four? four kids. Right. So, so <laughs> four kids in a hotel room? Hell no. And a baby that's my. And, and you got all something. boys except for your baby girl. So you know you <laughs> your boys need places to run yeah. around and a yard and a place to cook dinner and you know I think that the the hotels like again they just didn't move with the demand of the consumer. And people want a larger experience now. They want a place that feels like home that they can cook meals in. And, you know, Mike and I would go up, go to California with two teenage boys who don't wake up until noon. You know, I don't, I just want to drink a cup of coffee and watch the news or whatever. And there's no place to do that. So the Airbnbs give people an opportunity. Actually, there's short term rentals because there's multiple different platforms. Airbnb is just a platform but it gives people the opportunity to have the versatility to either stay in a room or stay in a pool house or, you know, get a different kind of experience. So it's just, you know, it, that's, it expanded the, the ability for people to stay in lots of different locations. Right. And the vacation rentals, they're usually huge houses, stay, stay vacant in the winter time. And they're specific to those high end vacation renters during the summertime. So um, I, I there's so much more demand for short-term rentals than people really understand. Like we, can, we can't keep capacity. I mean, we're always over capacity and people are always asking me, do you have any place my people can stay for a month? I'm like, no, it's June. If they're going to pay $5,000, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're not doing $900, no, for the month. Um, somebody asked, were you able to get good contractors that worked good and fast? How do you create those relationships? Um, I, so contractors is an ongoing, they have a lifespan. Totally. <laughs> Believe it or not, my <laughs> best contractor that I have, uh, I met him, I, I solicited him off. I shouldn't say it like that. I found him on Craigslist. I didn't solicit him by a Craigslist, just for clarification. Yeah. He he placed an ad on Craigslist. It was not, it wasn't man for man or anything like that, but it was, uh, or missed connections. It was a trip. So, but anyway, but I met, I, you know, Rich put an ad on there. I was looking for, this has been obviously several years ago because you know, who goes to Craigslist anymore? But um, so he's been working with us for like seven years. Awesome. And so we had, so now, you know, he's kind of that work husband kind of thing where it's like, he know, you know, like we, we have that good dynamic. He knows what needs to be done. Um, we fight on occasion over ridiculous prices that he gives me, but I give it to him anyway, because <laughs> I'm making money. I want him to make money too, you know, no big deal. So anybody else? Oh, with the casinos coming in Portsmouth and Norfolk, yeah. do you see the changing regulations in those cities? Okay, so let's, no one's recording this, right? Oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> let's be clear about the hotel lobby. <laughs> and their, uh, they've the already lobbyists. got you. Let's not dive, let's not dive too deep. Too deep so. uh, yeah, I'm not going to dive too deep into that. But all I'm saying is there are larger forces at play. So if you have big investors who are coming in and putting casinos with big hotels, spending lots of money, you tell me, is the city going to change the regulation if their buddy who just built that ginormous hotel doesn't want them? Right. So, Very true. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of a big one. 
Um, but I, I, I really hope to see, I think, I mean, Norfolk, you can do Airbnbs in Norfolk. You just have to jump through all their hoops and they've got quite a few hoops. But it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. I think, I think that people aren't necessarily going to stay in Portsmouth or stay in Norfolk. They're going to want to stay in other places. So it's huge demand, huge demand. I think what we've been seeing too is, um, especially in like Norfolk and areas, everyone's like, oh, they're staying in Norfolk. Like people come to the area. Know. Yeah, they come they, to the area. Yeah, they come, and they, they're, they're looking at the descriptions going, oh, it's only a 15 minute drive down to the beach. Yeah. So they're not necessarily willing to stay at the beach. They just want a place they can spread out, be comfortable and, at a reasonable cost. I think if the casinos come, then it's just one more thing to draw people. They I, I think you're right though. The laws might change, but you just gotta like I think I think one of the key things that um from hearing you tonight and, and, and other times as well is you you move with the fluid of the market yeah. around you. And the opportunity yeah. that's around me. I think that's awesome. I think I think we all admire that about you. Um, Thank you. It's a diversification, think, right? And just diversifying in one. But so the vertical and horizontal, we've gone pretty horizontal in this field. So we have, you know, we're trying to hit all the multiple streams of income in real estate that we can, so that when something like this does happen, we ha we have enough diversification that we're not hit in any particular. I was worried about Matthew when this COVID thing hit. I was like, dude, how are you doing? He's like, we're good. We're 90% occupancy. I'm like, what? Yeah, no. Awesome. What? I, was, I started the Airbnb in in right when all this started. But that's because I spoke with Matt. And I was like, yeah, okay, we can do this. And if it doesn't work, like you said, you got those reserves. I can ride it out until yeah. the end of the summer. And, and then I'll go long term, you know? And then you'll be, you'll be fine. You know, yeah. you'll be fine. It'll all, it all works out. It all works out. So. Well, Carrie, just, I want to uh, say thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us tonight and spend, you know, the past hour here with us and the group, yeah. everybody that came on. Hopefully everybody got some really good information. We got a few people in there talking about tons of golden nuggets. Thank you for the time. Presentation was awesome. So as usual, it's always awesome to have you on here. Um, I know you came yeah. last year and talked with us uh, to the Airbnb. And then now this year, because of, this massive situation and talking to what the good and the bad is. So it's, it's been an awesome talk to hear all that. So I really appreciate you taking the time to come spend that time with us. Always a pleasure. I just want everybody to realize that, I mean, get out and play the game, man, come and play the game. Come play. Do not wait for the perfect moment. There isn't a perfect, every moment is the perfect moment. So come play the game with us. It's a lot of fun. I'm available. Um, I am more than happy to take your calls or your questions. I'm easy to find on Facebook, Copenhagen. It's not like it's Smith or Jones. I'm pretty easy to find. You can message me at any time. Um, you can Google my name. I'm, there's, I'm very easy to find. <laughs> maybe, maybe too much so. <laughs> but if I can help anybody in any way, just you know, reach out to me. Reach out to Sean. Reach out to Alex, Cameron. They all have my number, and I'm happy to kind of guide you through whatever you need help with. Awesome. And to finish this out real quick, what's everybody drinking? Because we are a beer group. What are we doing? Lucky Buddha. Lucky Buddha Lucky Lager. Buddha. Lucky Buddha. What do you got, <laughs> Alex? I did Shock Top tonight. Nice. I got to film the uh, orange beer. Nice. Cam, what do you got? I had an American Haze earlier. This is water, but I had an American Haze earlier. So nice. Out of Virginia Beach. So. We, uh, we were in West Virginia this past weekend, and we picked up this thing called Big Timber IPA. So it's out of West Virginia. It's pretty damn good. We found it in, like, the craziest location ever in a 7-Eleven. In, like, a the big hood. can. It's a big can. Yeah, 16-ounce can in the hood. Like, it was awesome. I like the double-bladed axe on there. Pretty tough. So, ladies, come on here. What are y'all drinking? Ashley, Vanessa, what do you got? Um, I finished mine, but I had a bold rock cider, uh, yeah. it was from my blackberry. And I think that was it for the seasonal. So I don't know if I can get any more. Right. <laughs> right. I went super from Peru. I've been self isolating since I was in the South Florida. So I only had what I had on hand. So some angry orchard. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <Good stuff. laughs> we had, uh, somebody said they're drinking some, uh, Templeton rye. Very nice. Wow. Very nice. Rye. What is rye? like a whiskey oh 
All right. So, guys, thank you so much. I appreciate everybody being here. Thank you for the time. Kim, I know you've been kind of quiet over there. We don't ever want to want to hear if you got something to say. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I'm good. Good. I was taking in I was taking in all these nuggets, man, from Carrie. Cool. Really good stuff. Really appreciate it. Just listening, Carrie. Always thank knowledge. You. Yep. Awesome. Alex, how about anything to finish this out and close us up? Nah, man. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for the uh, positive perspective and 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 just finding the uh, the light in the midst of uh, all this craziness in our real estate market. So we appreciate that. Awesome. As usual, guys, thank you so much for everybody that's watching the replay and hanging out with us. Uh, as always, check us out at Opportunity on our Facebook page. We got the fancy ticker running across the bottom. And uh, Ashley's that. been doing some uh, little banners out there and <laughs> hopefully you guys are seeing it. But again, thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much for joining us and watching the broadcast. And hopefully we'll see you next time. And we look forward to seeing you at a local meeting. And uh, thank you, everybody, for that was here. Talk to you guys later. Bye. See you guys. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.